in this episode of Mind Pump. So for the first 44 minutes, we do our introductory fun time, current events conversation. Fun time. After that, we get into the fitness portion of this episode. So we start out by talking about the new Dave Chappelle comedy special on Netflix. He takes all the third rails and jumps all over them. It was hot fire. One of my favorite comedians of all time. Then we talked about the post I did on veganism. Boy, did it stir up some controversy with some people uh, saying that the reason why I was saying that going vegan may not be a good idea for some people is because I'm sponsored by meat companies. Little do they know that our biggest sponsor is Organifi, the makers of vegan supplements that are extremely effective. Oh, and by the way, gold pumpkin spice juice is back. Gold juice is what something you would drink in the evening to relax your body and reduce inflammation, and it tastes absolutely delicious. Now, Organifi makes other organic, vegan-based supplements. If you go to Organifi.com forward slash Mind Pump and use the code Mind Pump, you'll get 20% off all of their products. Then I talked about uh, the fake followers are costing companies $1.3 billion dollars. There's a little bit of an influencer bubble that seems to be popping uh, popping at the moment. We talked about the social scoring system in Silicon Valley. It's kind of like China's, except uh, minus all that state yeah, authority. Yeah, let's get rid of the state. Killing people stuff. Um, then I talked about how the chili pad helps everybody sleep amazingly. And part of that beauty is the white noise that it creates. And I talk about the science behind white noise and why it helps people sleep. Now, chili pads are pads that you put on your bed. They circulate water and they give you whatever ideal temperature you want. So I like to sleep at about 64 degrees where my bed is nice and cool. So that's what I set it at. Jessica likes to set her side at about 67 degrees. I like a good Arctic breeze. <laughs> he likes to keep his freezing. Uh, we are sponsored by Chili Pad. So if you go to Chili Technology, that's C H I L I technology.com forward slash mind pump, you can use the discount codes on the page for massive discounts. Then I talked about the nuclear car. Uh, they, they've uh, invented a car that runs on nuclear power. You never have to fuel it for 100 years. It's kind of crazy. Hey. We talked about Aladdin the movie. We talked about how Disney uh, is not doing the binge model. Apparently, they think it's more responsible to do so, which I think is kind of cool. And then I mentioned a study that showed how close relationships have major impacts on your health. Then we got to the fitness portion of this episode. The first question, is yoga at home a few times a week? good for mobility? Is that a good mobility plan? Next question, this person wants to know, how do you adjust your client's macros when they're consistently non-compliant? So how do you deal with people who don't do what you want them to do? Comply! Next question, uh, how would you train clients who don't work out on their own? Nice extension from the first question, uh, that the question before. And the final question, this person wants to know, what's a profession that we value very highly, but we all think we could never do? Also, 48 hours left. That's it. There's only two days left for the MAPS Prime and MAPS Prime Pro 50% off sale. It's the first time we've ever put those programs at that big, big of a discount. And you only have two days left as of the dropping of this episode. Now, remember, MAPS Prime is a program that helps you design your pre-workout priming session. This is a fancy term for a very effective warm-up. Now, why is that important? Well, if you prime properly, you'll improve your mobility your range of motion. In other words, you'll make your current workout far more effective. A lot of people also don't know that if you prime before an athletic event, you'll have better performance. So if you like to play basketball, if you're in competitions, if you're a grappler, a boxer, football player, if you do a 15-minute individualized priming session before your competition, you'll have a better performance, and that's what My MAPS Prime provides for you. Now, MAPS Prime Pro is correctional exercise in nature. It takes all the major joints in the body, takes you through some tests, you identify your pro your problems, and then you get the right exercises for your body to improve your mobility, reduce pain, and reduce your risk of injury. Again, both programs, 50% off. Here's what you do. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and use the code PRIME50. That's P-R-I-M-E-5-0 for the discount. No space. Do it now. Dude, that Dave Chappelle comedy show. Mm. Woo! 
He, that was masterful. He is the most. Maybe my favorite, dude. That do you know he's how many people yet. he's pissing off right maybe now? Maybe my uh, favorite. He's everybody. Oh, have you have you read anything? Yes. On, oh, you have. Yes. Oh. So Vice already wrote an article and basically told everybody skip it because he's so. No, we'll skip Vice. Uh, yeah, fuck you guys. Yeah, he's get uh, out of here. He's he is offensive. He, he's a comedian, duh. And yeah. because of the current climate, it's funnier to yeah. be offensive, in my opinion. Tough. But he went hard. Yeah, he did. He took every third rail and. Had sex with it on stage. Yeah, yeah. he danced you know what I'm all saying? over. Yeah, no, for he sure. He just paved the way. I, I think that was my to come through. My favorite Dave Chappelle I've seen ever. He's. I he's, would say it's up there with some of his best stuff. I've I ever consider seen. him, in my opinion, the I, best I, ever, the best yeah. stand-up comedian. I think it was his time. last one. I wasn't a big fan of. I think his last one I was one of my least favorite ones he did. But this one was fire. Yeah, man. he he he's for me the most brilliant stand-up comedian. He's the funniest. He kills me every single time. Yeah, Chris. Uh, Chris D'Elia is mm-hmm. also hilarious. Yeah, he's funny. Um, who's the other guy? I love David like, Tell. He's one of my favorites. No, but, uh, bro, Bill, Bill Burr is Bill Burr's 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 my favorite. Goats. Bill Burr is also hilarious. Yeah. Also kills me. He's but my Cha- favorite. But Chappelle is just so smart and brilliant the he way he just delivers. Nailed it for the times. He takes you on a ride with his jokes. You think he's going one way, and you hear the audience agree with him. Yeah. But then at the end, he hits you with the reverse. Oh yeah. And he pisses everybody off, and then it makes you laugh. Oh, his his pro choice joke had me going. Oh bro. my god! I just dude. thought that was so. I've never heard someone put that spin on it. And I just <laughs> fucking died, and I didn't know. His where Michael he... Jackson talk got me crying. Dude. Oh. I was dying. He's dude. Well, best. speaking of controversy, how about? Sal's controversy yesterday on the freaking Instagram wow. post, dude. Oh, wow. Man. I didn't I didn't think it would cause that much controversy. I don't I even didn't think know I was that strong still. You know, like the 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 vegan response. No. I was I was waiting for it all forever. I, all I said on it was that I think that this huge trend to push everybody to not eat meat because it's bad is going to result in worse health because the average person just doesn't educate themselves on nutrition to begin with. So all they're going to do is cut meat out and replace it with probably processed foods. If you look at the average person diet, the the only whole natural food that they tend to eat or that's unprocessed tends to be the meats, eggs or chicken or milk. They're going to cut it out and replace it with garbage. And that's all I said. And I and I don't I didn't think I was that controversial, but oh my god, it was uh, yeah. I think it just flying. I think it just highlights what we've talked about on the show before that you know, people are so dogmatic and religious about Nutrition, They're irrational with it. It is so funny to me how we get so, um, yeah. What's the tribal. word? Yes, yeah. tribal with these these diets, this made up thing. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I brought yeah. it up on the episode we did that. You know, nobody did diets before. You know, it was just food. Yeah, it was like (laughs) you just ate to survive, right? And now we've decided that you know there's these camps of we're so wealthy. We can, yeah. we, can, right. we can be like, you know what? I'm not going to eat all that food Yeah, yeah. because it's against my will. Right. I know. And, pe- and the people that I see, you know, so many of them too, you can tell, uh, you know, you did such a great job with creating the, the post with just the, you know, go vegan, horrible advice or whatever you said. <laughs> they didn't They're read the shocking post. Off. Yeah, they didn't read the post because in there, and, and the same thing too, I, there was, I was going in there and I was like, you know, I was just kind of poking at people laugh out loud or like the face palm thing because I didn't want to get into that with everybody on there and just like... I can't believe that you guys are saying, and it's like, I, did you read the post? No. And have you listened to us talk about? The, yeah. I mean, it's we. It, it, and the, how about my favorite was the the guy who oh. uh, threw the jab about uh, butcher box. He goes, the, yeah, he goes, oh, of course you're going to be say this about veganism. Which, by the way, I never, I'm not against veganism. In fact, we say all the time how you can be healthy and eat a vegan diet. You just have to plan it well. But anyway, he goes, yeah, of course you're going to say that. You're sponsored by. A meat company. <laughs> and so Adam gets on there and he goes, um, Organifi is our biggest sponsor by far. Yeah. They're a vegan supplement company, like, <laughs> yeah. like vegan protein powder and all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Idiot. Instantly shut them yeah. up. They but pay it, us like five times as much. Oh, as, yeah. Uh, no. Which, which, but here's, and then here's the thing, though, that nobody is, uh, you know, we don't have a dog in this fight. Nobody is uh, paying us enough money to get us to change our message on how we talk about anything. You can't. And even though even though we are even though we talk about uh butcher box and organify and products like that we always say well butcher box is whole foods but we're always pitching people to go for whole foods all natural. We'll always stick to that message that that's the most ideal yeah, thing. And we like look organify is a vegan uh company. If you look at all their products, they are plant-based. Mm-hmm. Um it's part of their brand. They have a protein powder that's vegan. I can't have dairy personally. 
Now, Adam and Justin can have dairy. Uh, Justin, in particular, has no issues with yeah, it. And, all day long. Or at least he thinks he doesn't have issues. <laughs> I don't know. He might. Milk and cheese and milk and cheese yeah. all day the long. toilet might disagree. Yeah. <laughs> no, but all, all joking aside, deal with the toilet. I can't have whey protein. And so when we initially worked with or we're talking about working with a company for supplements, um, that was one of the big things. It's like, I, I, I'm not, I can't promote something I can't use. I won't do that. And Organifi came to us and, um, I mean, you know, vegan protein powder, it tastes really good. It's got great ingredients. Oh, it's in, the best, in my opinion, it's the best vegan protein powder that's out there. It is. It's very, very well made. But yeah. it's funny that, pe- that, that people think that we're biased because we work with a meat company. Well, they're just when our looking biggest sponsor for something. Is, yeah, and it's just not yeah. true. And you can't – look, here's the thing. And sponsors know that – and they've learned their lesson with us. Sponsors <laughs> now leave us alone. They let us do our thing. But in the early days, sponsors would try to get us to change what we said. or when we're like, <laughs> we will do the opposite of what yeah. you say if you try to tell us what to do. Well, yeah. we – you know, We have to – we're just going to be honest. There's so. the, there's this uh, – you know, obviously podcasting is – is gaining traction and popularity and you know the normal formula for most people that are podcasters you know they they build a network up and advertising is their their main source of revenue and something that when we built this originally we we built it with the intention of not really advertising at all and that was never going to be that was never part of the business plan oh and still today it's uh it's less than 20 percent of the revenue that mind pump makes so it's not it'll never be a thing that drives us uh, and makes us uh, talk a certain way, and we we all agreed on that. And and I'm glad we built it that way. Uh, we don't we could get rid of all advertising sponsors, and we'd still be fine. The business would continue on, and we'd be what, one totally of the things okay. I value most about the new media space, which it, it includes podcasting, but also includes things like you know YouTube and writing your own content uh, through the internet, is that the you don't have major barriers, corporate barriers like you used to. Like but in the past, yeah. if I wanted to do a radio show with with you guys, if we wanted to start a radio show, we would have to go through, we'd have to be on a uh, on a channel yeah. that would have their own corporate sponsors and we would have to talk a certain way and promote certain things. Otherwise, they would never our show would not exist. We yeah. came out hard against most of what people preach. There's no way in hell anybody would have had us on. So I, we value that freedom more than anything. So if we work with a sponsor, you better believe it's because we actually like it, w- their product and what they're all about. And if the day we don't, I don't care how much money they're paying us, we're whoosh, yeah, we can tell them to kick rocks. Right. You know? So it, anyway. it wouldn't work. There's anyway. no way it happened. But yeah, I couldn't believe the the, the controversy in there it was pretty. It was pretty funny. But there were a few dietitians and you know registered dietitians that were on there that were like, no, you, the points you make are are totally accurate. Some of the points I made had to do with potential nutrient deficiencies that you just have to pay attention to. You know, when you eat vegan, you just have to pay attention to, to these nutrient deficiencies that can pop up and often do for a lot of people. Um, and that's why you need to do a lot of really careful planning and sometimes supplementation. I know most uh, or many uh, of my friends who are vegan athletes and vegan uh, fitness experts um, all recommend that they th- their clients and themselves take at least vitamin B12. That's one of the, the main ones. I but. feel like you should follow. I feel like you should follow the post up with a uh, almost identical one, but for carnivore diet. I, I, I should. Just to fuck with <laughs> all of them. Just like make their People's heads. People's hands would explode. Oh, just explode. Man. Oh my God. Wait no. a second. This doesn't make sense. Yeah, just <laughs> see, then you go back to the Dave Chappelle. Like, that'd be like the perfect setup for that. Like you get such a, a polarizing contrast, you know, with the setup and then the punchline. You line. should. You should write a post yeah. on the other side because I think that, uh, again, we would say the same thing. I think that. That's horrible advice for most people. I don't think most people should be on a 100% carnivore diet whatsoever. Uh, it just highlights how emotional and irrational, you know, people are these days. That's why I loved I loved it so much because it just it was playing with the most taboo topics and just throwing it at you like I know this is going to upset you but like look how ridiculous that is. <laughs> yeah, totally. It's getting so out of control though. I'm a little I'm a little nervous about like how crazy it's. I mean, the documentary What the Health I felt it was like the the beginning of it like getting crazy and it's i thought it would slow down after a lot of people spoke out about that and i yeah. know like the our buddies like lane norton came out and did a whole youtube on how terrible what the health was but you know what it's it still missed a lot of people and i see it in my own family I well see. what's happening now for the first time ever and i've never seen this before is i've never diets have always been kind of religious people have always treated 
right. nutrition in, in that way. It's always been, especially if you're but in. They health weren't and fitness, politically motivated like they are now. No, it's the first time I've ever seen a diet be uh, politicized. Yeah. I've never seen a diet be politicized. It's never been, and and the reason why it's being politicized is they're connecting it to it being better for the environment, which the science will show you. It's far more complicated than that, and you can actually eat vegan and have practices that are worse for the environment than someone who's an omnivore and vice versa. Um, but the fact that it's getting politicized means it's just you're going to get more divisiveness and more you're the enemy, I'm not the enemy because I eat a particular way and you eat a particular way. And it's just crazy to me. It's insane to me that, that that's happened. But uh, you're, you know, these days, everything, everything's becoming politicized. Your freaking your, – your razors are politicized. Your shaving cream is politicized. <laughs> yeah. The car you buy, like – it's insane to me. I can't watch football without it having politics in it. It's like, what the fuck? Yeah, it's, a, it's get a, out of here. Yeah, that's just you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of media out there, and social media is just making it become more a bigger part of our life. I was talking to um, this woman who works with uh, children. She's an expert on child psychology, and I asked her what she thought about the exploding rise of depression and anxiety among children, which is kind of weird if you look at statistics on anxiety and depression and you know uh, those types of feelings the age group that is experiencing the fastest upswing is the age group that historically has never had problems with those things which are children children typically have the lowest rates of anxiety and depression and yet they're the ones that are experiencing the highest uh, acceleration of those things and it's connected or at least it matches up and correlates with the rise of the use of smart technology like smartphones and stuff. So I, I thought, you know, well, it must be because they're distracted all the time. They're not, you know. So I, I told her that. And I said, do you think it has to do with the all the technology and smartphones? She says, yes, but not what people think. She says, when we were kids, we had no idea about the world's troubles. Like, when you were a kid, did you watch the news? No. Kids did not watch the news. The news is boring as fuck. No kids... But now they're constantly being informed either through social media. And it might not be a news that they're following, but it might be their favorite celebrity that says something right, like, right, that's a good point. climate change is going to kill us all. Or, oh my God, there's another gu- you know shooting in on the other side of the country. Or look what's happening. And so they're just getting inundated with so much of this information around the world. And the, the part that makes us anxious is there's nothing you can do about it but worry. You know what right. I'm saying? Like if you're, Especially if you're a kid, you're, you feel helpless. So and, I think and kids dominate social platforms. Totally. So yeah. a majority of the conversations are probably stupid conversations that are totally. being had on, on social media platforms. Totally. So I think, you know, I think that's why everything's feeling like it's getting politicized is because we're on all these social platforms. Where, how many people follow politics before? Not very many, but now everybody yeah. does because they're just talking about it through I wonder if it's gonna get so ridiculous that people just stop. Like it just gets it gets played out. Like, yeah. like, 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 like are it we could, it could happen right wouldn't that be crazy if we're like just in this like social media bubble right now because it's so cool it's I so think great so. to be connected and then in like 10 years from now people are like people will like shame you if you are like oh you're on instagram and facebook like yeah. really you spend your time doing that like you, you, look do you at, think it could go that way look at the influencer bubble we just oh, talked yeah. about this influencers are losing their power you know, it's inter- I was just reading something like a statistic that was talking about companies that invest in influencers and how like the fake followers have, have actually cost them something like one point three billion dollars uh, because they put all this money into. Oh, this person has a lot of influence because of the numbers that they look at and, yeah. you know, the, this fake engagement and all this stuff that they're promoting. But it's it's not real. They're yeah. not getting any conversions and they're losing a lot of money by investing in these. people. Yeah, I don't know if that's a sign, though, of uh, of potentially social media bubble popping and more so just I think more people are well I think it's just aware yeah they're aware yeah like, yeah I think more people are savvy to you know oh this is the this is the new hustle now everybody wants to be a YouTube star or an Instagrammer get big enough and then well it just partner shows with that companies it, and sell sell products I think it just shows its impact is not what it once yeah. was and that's what I mean by the bubble is it's kind of popping. Mm. Like you look at like the big, values drop. Bro, of that. look at the big, big pages from a few years ago and look at their engagement now. Yeah. It's oh, terrible. I was just telling you guys, I mean, I just, Brad Castleberry popped up in my explore page and I hadn't looked at that kid in forever. And, you know, he's got like, he's approaching close to a million followers 
And I mean, his likes, he gets a few thousand likes, he gets less than a hundred comments. And I'm like, oh my God, that just, that's crazy. Yeah, it doesn't add up. The ratio to that. Yeah. I just think that a, a ton of people, you know what happens with things like that? And I, and I, at least this is what I think, because this is what happens, how I do it. Like a buddy sends me somebody's page and it's like hilarious. Like it's a hilarious meme or it's something. And maybe you look at a second one they have on their page and they're like, oh, this is funny. Or like you see someone like him as an example, doing some crazy feat. He's super fast or he's super strong. And then you follow just as a, out of a reaction, like, oh, that's interesting. I wonder if he'll post something else like that again. And then you never pay attention again, but you're still following him. So I think yeah, that- Yeah, you haven't unfollowed. Yeah, that happens to a lot of people that um, you know are following these type of people that use like headlines or gimmicks to get quick attention. You get the quick attention, you get the follow from somebody, but nobody really gives a shit, you know, yeah. until you do something goofy enough or silly enough for me to share with my friend. I ain't really, and then and that I'm just paying attention. I'm really not listening to anything you have to You're say. You're not giving me value. Yeah. You're not really influencing me in any real way. No, totally yeah, true. Staying on this topic though, um, I was, a fast company had an article like, cause we talked a long time ago about like China's social scoring system that they had implemented. And like, we were all a little like worried about that in terms mm -hmm. of like the state sort of controlling and manipulating the population by, you know, rewarding them for things. And then also like taking things away and so they're saying that like there's also elements of that in silicon valley which is kind of obvious after i read through it quite a bit but a couple of them stuck out one of them was like uh insurance companies can actually go through like your social media and like instagram and everything and see pictures of like things that like present high risk situations <laughs> and driving and talking on your and we're literally just feeding it to them and so it's like lowering uh you know the chances you're going to get a good rate and also like on the other end of it kind of rewarding people who are doing good things so isn't there an insurance company that is that's doing this now i thought i saw a commercial for this where you can opt into uh, this thing that basically allows them to monitor everything. They can track like your speed that you're driving because your phone's on you. Oh yeah, and then it could track like the speed the car is oh, moving. Them all the information. Yeah, you and give them plug it into the car. Somehow, yeah, like I, I don't know how it works, but I I thought I saw a company saying that it, the whole pitch was like you shouldn't pay for insurance that you don't need, and you know so if you're not a high risk driver and you only drive this speed limit, you you don't break the laws and like you can, but you have to submit like the approval for them to yeah. ha but, gain access to all that's that. That's interesting. But well, social wise, I mean. I mean, they're going, I mean, to, to go further with this too, like they have like bars and restaurants and stuff where they actually have like a, yeah, like a service where if you come in and they, they give you a score at the end of the, uh, at the end of the night, based on like, if, if you were like, you know, like an asshole, you know, they're like, they didn't want you to come back. And so they would like flag you. And so all this gets thrown into the software. And so they can actually use this information now and like uh, cross reference other restaurants and things. If you're like a patron, that's a problem, you know? And so that this is all happening within the private sector. And so I love it. The, yeah. The, the, the difference being, so the massive difference being one is state run has those initiatives versus like private. Like I get to use these amenities and these things, you know, that huh. private yeah. companies own. I don't mind. I don't mind if it's private uh, as long, you know, they, as long as they don't have the power to jail me or legislate or, you know, whatever. I'm all good. I think it's brilliant. I think it's a very, very cool way of getting great service if you're a good patron. And if you're a shit, you know, butt, then you stay at home. Yeah. You know what I mean? People will know about it. But people, and it used to be that way. Here's the thing: when societies were tight and small, that's how it was. Mm -hmm. You, if you fucked up at the tavern, everybody knew because yeah. there was one tavern right. in the whole town. Right. So I, I don't mind this at and all. You become just, a pariah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, speaking of companies, it's interesting. You just, you just reminded me of something. I'm curious if you guys know, and I wonder if Doug wanted it knew, knows this company too. It just came up. Um, you guys familiar with a company called Owler, like Owl? No. O-W-L-E-R. Uh -huh. Yeah, me either until just recently, and they've been popping up. The CEO is based here out of San Mateo. Um, but I find it interesting what, what, what they're doing, and I'm curious to see how well uh, it's going and if it takes off. But it seems like it's a... Um, almost like a, a Wikipedia type of uh, platform for businesses, meaning... Uh, I mean, you could get on there and you can put us in there even. Uh, you can put any uh, random company... 
and it's uh, it's crowdsourced, right? So the, to to prove it, like how Wikipedia is, right? Wikipedia is just a collection of everybody mm -hmm. put, putting in, and it's getting more accurate, more accurate, more accurate to where now it, you they're so crowdsourced, right? Yeah. It's now it's considered a, a, a reliable source, right? But when it first started, it was just like a, probably a few people on there putting their two cents on whatever you're you're wikiing. Well, this hour one is it for is for businesses, so you can look up. You want to know revenue that uh, a company's making. You want to know how many employees they are, how they treat their employees. They have a rating for the CEO. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, no, it's kind of cool. So, mm. and it shows you how many people are following and contributing. So, like for example, there's not a lot of people. I don't think we have hardly anybody, if anybody, that's following Mind Pump and actually contributing to this because we're a small company and there's probably not a lot of people that give a shit. But there's like you go get on there with Amazon and it gives you you know thousands of people are contributing to this so you can get a pretty good I was messing around and looking at companies that I was actually intrigued by and I didn't know I was curious like I wonder how big they are like I think they're this big and I hear this about them but you know and I started putting those companies in there and it gives you like an estimation of their annual revenue it gives you mm. an estimation of their employees it gives you a CEO rating what people are rating the CEO like. That's huh. awesome. I know. Isn't that interesting? I yeah, think that's super cool. Yeah. That's more, more transparency, but bringing it from the outside. Well, it's it's awesome too because it's great for it's great for the market. It's great for people looking for for work. Right. And, yeah. Right. You you see, uh, that's what I thought was cool. Like you see a company that oh I'm, I was really interested in working for these mind pump media guys, but then you see like oh shit yeah, what's the, the perception the CEO gets a forty rating. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> maybe I don't want to go work for these guys, but that's cool though. And right? he's really moody. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Stop talking about Adam like that. <laughs> anyway, so check this out. So I was reading this article uh, the other day uh, that I thought was fascinating that I wanted to bring to your guys' attention. So I was noticing that with the Uller, the chili pad, the, the, the sound that it makes is kind of that white noise. Mm -hmm. And I was noticing that the noise also helps me sleep. Oh, bro, here's something funny totally. for you. So you check this out. Okay, so... I think I told you guys this. I've been sleeping on the couch for the last like month, right? So that's kind of like my MO. <laughs> it's your new home. Yeah, it's my new home. And I go down about midnight or so. I, I, I head downstairs and I sleep down there where it's about 10 degrees cooler than it is upstairs. Um, and what Katrina does is, and I didn't know this till the other day because I asked her, I'm like, why is the, the Uller on? Because I'm not, she, it's on my side of the bed, right? So she doesn't use the, the Uller on her side. I use it on my side because I need it to be a lot cooler. And uh, the last couple of mornings I've come up and she's like, no, like everybody sleeps better. She's like the baby sleeps better with the humming of the Uller. And so does Mozzie. So Mozzie lays his head down, sleeps right next to the thing. And so does and the baby and the baby yep. loves the, the sound. She goes, she goes, I've noticed like I turned it off uh, one of the nights back when you weren't in the room. And it was one of the worst nights that he slept. He was fussy all night long. And she's like, and then and she goes, I don't know if it's just correlation or what. No, but. no, there's science to support this. So there's two ways, obviously, that the, the chili pad or the Uller helps with sleep. Obviously, the, the main one is it keeps your bed at the temperature that you like to sleep best in. So for most people, it's cool. I like, I'm about 64 degrees. Uh, Jessica's about 67 degrees on the bed. I think, what do you put yours yeah. at, like 59? Yeah, I'm just like low. I'm, yeah, I'm all yeah. the way down. You're all the way down. Yeah. So it just keeps it cool and it keeps your body temperature down. You sleep. But then there's the white noise that it makes as the as the machine is circulating the water through the pad. And I'm like, you know, I know there's white noise machines that people buy specifically to sleep. Yeah. Like you and people do this for kids my, all the time. My kids sleep. They have to sleep. With yeah, I rem that's the yeah. that's what made me remember because the, the couple times we've gone on vacation together with our kids, mm -hmm. you'll go in the in the kids' room and you'll turn on a white noise machine mm -hmm. to help them sleep. So I'm like, I wonder what the science is to support this because so many people talk about it. So I looked it up, and I, apparently, while you're sleeping, your brain is still processing sound. Your ears, because obviously, you know, you got to be on the lookout for predators. That's how we evolved. Uh, so your brain is still processing sound, but what it what it will alert you to isn't necessarily sound as much as it's changes in sound. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. It's the big changes. Yeah. yeah, it's the inconsistency in sound. And what white noise does is it masks all the sounds of the mm -hmm. house, and it makes yeah. them all sound. Your brain perceives it as everything being the same, still and silent, basically. So, so you're you're going to sleep very, very good. Yeah. Rather than it's silent in the house, then the house creaks a little bit, not that loud, but because it's a change. You ever happen you were sleeping yeah. and the house moves a little bit and you wake up, you know, or something drips and you wake up or whatever. Yeah. White noise masks all that, and it, it so it keeps your brain processing in the sense that it thinks that the sounds are all 
level in the same. That's so great. So, so it helps you sleep both ways, yeah. those two different ways. I think we're definitely getting our money's worth then. So because even when I'm not all laying on the pad, it's actually being ran inside my room right now to help the, ba- the baby and the dog. <laughs> Dude, sleep I sleep so hard. I use. I sleep so hard with that thing. It's, <laughs> it's crazy. So great. Anyway, so I know you know we were we, we've been. Uh, I brought up nuclear power a couple times on the podcast when we're talking about clean energy and how yeah yeah that's right. actually a very clean form of energy. So this company created a car. I'm going to bring it up right now so I don't mess this up. This company created a car with that's a nuclear reactor, nuclear powered, that'll run for a hundred years without ever having to get refueled. How the hell? I mean, yeah. it, I used to, to be like huge. Like, this no, is like, I've been saying this forever though that the whole automobile industry is a big fucking scam. I mean, the fact that we can build <laughs> a spaceship, dude, to go to the fucking moon and back and be able to handle that makes yeah. me go like, how yeah, can we not car build? Only lasts we like can't, five years. Yeah, we can't build yeah. an engine to go hundred thousand miles. Come yeah, on, yeah, get yeah. the fuck out of here I with know. that. <laughs> well, so this company is called Laser Power Systems, and they created a concept for a car that's powered by thorium. So thorium, it's a radioactive element. And here's the thing about thorium that's really cool. I don't think, or I th- I'm almost positive, you can't turn it into weapon-grade nuclear um, material. <laughs> so in other words- well, you, you gotta that. put that out there. You know, that's no, and my this is, first no, thought. And this yeah. is good because, this is good because- Where do you go to Asgard to get that? Where's that place? <laughs> Where? Asgard? Asgard. Thorium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, Let's you know go why go this is good? Gates of Mordor. Because a lot of times the US will, and other countries will oppose other countries' attempts at creating nuclear power for themselves. Mm-hmm. And one of the, the, the reasons why we oppose it is because they can take that material or the same technology and then create a nuclear weapon. Well, thorium, I believe you can't do that. It's just used for energy. But anyway, check this hmm. out. This is kind of crazy. So it's so dense that just a small sample of it packs 20 million times more energy than a similarly sized sample of coal. That's how much energy is in- 20 million. 20 million times. Wow. In fact, if you, I mean, it said here, if you created a turbine made from this material that was the size of an air conditioning unit, Okay. That alone would power a whole restaurant, hotel, or maybe even a small town to show you just how much Dang. power is in this thing. So just to show you the power of nuclear power, if we were really to go after it without fear or whatever with our now, technology. How ugly is this car? Oh, well, the car looks looks all weird. It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's I mean, always a problem. And what is, what is your, what's your thoughts on us eventually going this direction? Do you I think, think we might have to. Do you think so? I think we do. I think it's political suicide right now. Here's Whoa, what the car that's the like. car? Yeah. Oh, there he is. Doug brought it up. Whoa. Yeah. Oh, it's very futuristic. Yeah, I know. Um, I think it's political suicide right now because people are afraid of nuclear. They think it's dirtier than other forms of energy when it's not. It's actually far cleaner. People, you know, we have memories of things like Chernobyl um, or Fukushima power plant, what happened during the earthquake. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that type of danger. And then, of course, nuclear. We know nuclear bombs and, and nuclear war. Uh, but this thorium might be the might be the answer, and if we're able to educate the population, you know, I mean, I feel like properly. I feel like any company that could afford to do this, right? They already have the access to the nuclear power and could technically build a bomb, anyways, right? Do you really think that we we are keeping anybody who actually is a threat and a force from having nuclear power? Uh, I it's definitely you, a lot. There's mo- a lot of countries don't have a nuclear power mm. or a nuclear weapon. A lot of countries don't. That we know of. Yeah, like Iran. Iran is going after it, um, and they have for a long time, and they haven't they haven't detonated anything. Um, it, it's it's a big problem, but it's kind of fascinating, right? You imagine that, having a car that yeah. you never would – that's it. You buy it, and, and it it's going to It always run. runs. It's Yeah, that's it. You're done. Or you or you get these power plants that are, you know, like I said, the size of an air conditioning unit, and it powers you know your neighborhood. Yeah. Off of that, you just hook up to that one thing and your whole neighborhood's powered. What by. do you think? Do you think that we would see if we could have cars? That's interesting because cars have like, um, they've, they've almost changed into, uh, they're not just a necessity. They're like a luxury item for sure. us. You know, so like trends and like even like the, they're, they're, even the automobile industry has been so smart to, you know, what is it about every five years or so, the, the next model comes out. You know, it's a, and so even if you had a car that you could buy today that would last you the next thirty to forty years, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. would you? You'd and be would, out of style, right? No, yeah. really, though. Yeah. I mean, think about that. That's you, true. Like, would it would it work? That's would, true. Would I it, what I think would be maybe cars that are electric uh, that you charge by uh, when the charging stations are powered. You just buy new like bodies this. for it. Yeah. Oh, maybe. Yeah. Just, you, you put it over the shell. 
Yeah, like the old school cars that you used to play with when you were yeah, kid. Yeah, the remote yeah, control yeah. cars. Yeah, it's like a funny just, car. Yeah. Like, you know, those, uh, those, uh, yeah. Well, here's what Drag else. Drag racer cars. Here's what else that article said. That it said that thorium and the technology of using thorium is so good in terms of the radioactivity that it produces that you could shield the th- radioactivity with a thin piece of aluminum. So that's it. It's all you need. Yeah. So it's like oh, wow. super safe. Did you guys happen to read the the articles that I sent late last night? Did you guys get that? Doug's normally up with me. I was surprised I don't think he I got any articles. To. Okay. So last night I watched. It had to be sexy. I watched Disney's Aladdin with Will Smith. Oh, mm-hmm. I saw that. Did, so did you read? Did you see the article? I did. I saw the title. I didn't read it though. So I thought this was interesting. So I'm watching it now. Aladdin was something that uh, I watched a thousand times growing up because I have a little sister and brother, and that was like popular during. You know, and you know, you guys obviously know you have kids. So you know, kids at a certain age. I don't remember what age this is. It's somewhere between probably two and five. They watch the same thing over like a thousand times, right? Like a billion oh, times. Yeah. When yeah. they like it, it's like on repeat. Right. So Aladdin was one of those things as a kid growing up that I remember, I vividly remember like all about it, like as far as like the, the little details. And I'm watching this one with Katrina and we're laying there and I'm like, you know, they, it's musical, right? It's Disney. So it's got all the music. Was, it was well made, wasn't it? Yeah, it was done well. Yeah. It was done very well. Uh, but it got a lot of uh, heat though. Uh, it, it, it only got, well, not a lot of heat. So? There was controversy around it, right? And But I didn't know any of this yet. So I'm just watching it, right? I'm watching it because it's Will Smith and I, I like Disney and I'm, and I'm watching. And I was curious when I clicked on it that it was only, it only got like a 56% on like Rotten Tomatoes, whatever, which is pretty low, for, especially for a Disney movie. So anyways, I'm watching it and about halfway through, she starts singing a song that is not one of the songs, mm. right? So every uh, other they song, added a song. They added a song, mm. and and I'm listening to the lyrics, and I'm like, it's a total like, I am woman, hear me roar. Yeah, like an empowering. Uh, song. Yeah. yeah, and so of course that sent me down the rabbit hole. I started googling right away, like you know, Aladdin controversy, Aladdin song added, and all, and then that's the articles that I sent over to you guys, mm. and they did. So they they inserted this this song and it was to counter the original Latin. So the original Latin had a part in there where she's singing songs and you know the men are dancing around her and her voice is being drowned out by mm. by uh, their voices. Their voices are much more powerful and that you can't hear hers and you know she's being drowned by sand in this little time thing. And so they wanted to uh, you know counter that or mm you know, have a message that was interesting. I thought that was really fascinating. And and what I would, what I wanted to talk to you guys about, and it started this, you know, you know, 11 o'clock at night dialogue between Katrina and I on if I'm pro it or not. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and, and, you know, I find it interesting. Well, the, 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 the classic, I guess, the person inside of me that appreciates classics Oftentimes, I get a little annoyed when they change a classic mm-hmm. because that's the one that I identified with. Because when I was a kid, it was Aladdin, the cartoon. So it's like you change it, you're like what are you doing? You're changing my favorite, you know, my favorite cartoon. But then there's the other side of me that's like, you know, that's just that's pop culture. That's what we've always done. We've right. always taken old things and made them a little bit different to make them maybe more marketable or better. So here are my thoughts like on a it. refresh. So here yeah. are my thoughts on it. I love Disney as a company altogether. I think that um, this is. Uh, I, I like if you're going to make a message, right? If 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 you're going to send a message, um, you know, I think that's a very uh, tasteful way to do it, right? To incorporate this song mm-hmm. that's, you know, it's not hardcore political. It probably went over ninety. It doesn't change the story. It doesn't change the story right. completely, but it, you know, it does. It 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 empowers her more. It it shares. It basically highlights that she can be strong and independent. And it's mm-hmm. like okay. So there's the side of me that's like, that's cool. Like, I, I think that's a good message for mm-hmm. young girls growing up right now. And I think that's that's tasteful and a, and a neat way to do it. Then I have the other side of me that, that's like you, Sal, that's like, well, fuck, man. You're, it's, it's, it's a different, you're changing, you're changing it. Like mm-hmm. you're changing a classic that you, that was like a, a super famous cartoon that was mm-hmm. huge and a great story. And so... Uh, that side of me is just like, well, then how long do we keep doing that? And like, you know, a hundred years from now, you won't even know the original story because we're going to bastardize the shit out of it because of everyone's offended over all yeah. these little things. Yeah. So, I, and my thought was, I, I'm I'm pro the message that she's giving, but then my thought is like, then create a whole new cartoon, 
create a different show that gives that message. And that's a great way that Disney can highlight what they're trying to say or uh, communicate yeah. to the, the younger generation and stay on pop yeah. culture. You know, from a business end, that's a massive hit for them. Yep. They're just like refurbishing one little thing to you know bring to the public again. So in terms of money, I would think that's a lot easier for them than creating an entire new storyline. And, and stories have always done that. This is not a new phenomenon. Stories always have changed through the generations to reflect the current generation or erase something that might not be um, as palatable. Like, for example, remember Ring Around the Rosie? Mm. Remember that song with your yeah, friends? Ring yeah. Around the Rosie, pocket full. That song is about the plague. That's a plague, right? Yeah, everybody that, dying. That whole song is about the plague. Right. It's about all the, the symptoms of getting the plague. It's about carrying flowers in your, in oh, your pants dark, to dark hide the song. smell of the dead. Yeah. And we all fall down. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. We all die. Um, and But when we were kids, I had no idea. Yeah, it was that's, like fun. <laughs> I had no idea that's what it was about. So right. uh, stories have been changing for – it's it's never going to stop. It's just a reflection. It, and they're just making it more – maybe they're trying to make it more palatable. Yeah, yeah you know? and I know. I've read something too. Like I don't know if it was uh, – I mean, somebody that was overseeing, like, um, the, you know, the Star Wars franchise and Marvel and then, you know, also the princess sort of, you know, the whole thing with Disney. It was just kind of looking back into those those things and, like, especially with the princess thing, like, how can we, you know, portray, you know, so, so it's not so they're meek and, and you know, yeah. need, need help saving all the time. I think that was, like, a, a big initiative that they're well, trying to address. The thing that, I, I mean, here's And I thing. like that. I appreciate that because- Well, I, I, I think Disney is, I love Disney because I think Disney does it, they're, they're, they do it just right. I feel like it, that's what it was that created the great conversation. And I was like, you know, most of the times I think I would be not a fan of this, of, like, changing a, a message just to fit the climate currently today and stuff. But I think Disney did it in a very tasteful way that most people probably didn't even see it. And it went over them. And I said, and I think that's, that's pretty cool. I even, I love right now too, uh, what Disney is doing to address, um, addiction to, uh, the binge watching, why everybody else, uh, that's in the business of watching Netflix series and who, uh, oh, yeah, uh, yeah doing things that. like that. It's, I mean, it would be advantageous for the company to to get right in line with everybody else and drop give like them the whole season. season at once. Yes, yeah. and promote the binging, but they recognize uh, the behaviors behind that. Is and that it, why they're not doing? Yeah, that? no, I read a go. That's whore. what they said. So you got to mm -hmm. wait a week, just like the old model. So I thought that they would they would do that because maybe it's a better model in terms of getting people to watch your show, anticipate it. Talk Talk about no, it, but you're no. saying it's because they don't like binging. Yes. Yeah, that's great. Wow. Yeah. So I think that's wow. I think that's really neat that you know it's probably it probably would be better for them business wise to promote binging and the addiction sure. to watching the shows nonstop like that. But you know, part of their model is they're going to release it the same way like HBO and well, Showtime does. Yeah, where it's which once part a week. of me is a little bit like, oh, because The Mandalorian. I just watched a trailer for that and got oh, like yeah. super pumped, and uh, so I'm gonna have to wait week by week yeah. for the episodes. Right. Well, if you think about it, you know, imagine Name. imagine your kids watching the Disney Network and just binge watching 15 episodes of a show that's out and crying because you want to turn it off. Probably right. You're probably right. It's not a good look. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So no. now it's like, oh, honey, the, the next yeah. episode's not out till next week or whatever. No, I just think that's, <laughs> I mean, again, highlighting- it's Unhealthy what, behavior. Why I like the company. I think the Smart. They, they take a lot of things into consideration. They have real tasteful ways to go about it. I mean- Again, why I love why I love Disney. I'm pro Disney. So smart. Yeah. I uh, uh, I was reading uh, on longevity and health um, the other day as well, and I was shocked to find how important close relationships and the people around you are to your longevity. It's actually a major factor in your health and longevity. A major factor. It's one of the most consistent thing they find with centenarians. And the article that I found showed that there was something like, I'm going to pull it up here because it, it was uh, it was insane, that the research is showing something like a 50%, oh, here it is. One study found that a lack of strong relationships increased the risk of premature, premature death from all causes by 50%. 15%. Mm. The effect on mortality- 15 or 50? 50. 50. 50. Wow. So not 15 having- 15 is a lot. 50 no, is crazy. 50. So not having good relationships in your life is roughly comparable to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Whoa. <laughs> yep. And, and worse for you than obesity and being inactive. Huh. So being, it's actually worse for you Whoa. than being obese. And now not, that's inactive. crazy to me. Yes. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, it, it just goes to show like- 
why things like you know like why we're it so tribal sense. why we're why we why religion exists why we have groups why we we're such social creatures right, community so why important. the geneva convention says that you know isolating a prisoner is a cruel and it's unusual cruel and punishment unusual, yeah you know it's crazy how big of an impact it has on our health and here's the, the the reason why i'm a communicator what the reason why i think this is this is crazy and why i brought this up right now on this episode is because oftentimes People who are fanatical about their fitness and are obsessed with their body do so at the expense of the relationships uh, with their friends and family. Mm. They're so obsessed with their diet. They're so obsessed with their workouts that they don't have lots of friends, that well, they lose is- relationships with significant others, mm. and and they all think that they're making themselves healthy, Right. when in reality, they're actually doing themselves far worse. They probably would be better off not working out that much and having good relationships. What a great, to what a great fucking point. But this Isn't is what we, this is why yeah, we talk crazy. about though that when makes when sense. making decisions about you know a food like eating a piece of cake. Like sometimes it's actually healthy, and that may sound crazy because of the connection, right? With because be, when it is when it is in that situation, like because I tell you what, one way to lose friends really quick is go yeah. to a bunch of social events and be the asshole eating out of his plastic container yeah. all the time. You know, what I'm saying? or you never you know, can go out because right, well, you people, can't go, you people can't stop eat. inviting you. Yeah, you know, you're not going to invite the guy to dinner you're all the time if I'm, if I'm always carrying the plastic container around, and you're no fun to be around and eat and drink and have a good time. How and, many people in the bodybuilding fitness world lose a boyfriend or girlfriend or get divorced? Because they're literally so uh, obsessed with working out and yeah. nutrition that they they don't nurture their relationship, and then their argument is, well, this is good for me. It's healthy. It justifies it, right? They justify their obsession. Mm. It's actually not. It's actually not good for you. Relationships actually rank higher than uh, a lot of the other health practices. You guys are the closest bodybuilder friends I've ever had. <laughs> Just so you know, <laughs> yeah, they, they don't do well with me. Oh, that's great. All right, our first question is from Apple Saucy 714 yeah. Is simple yoga Saucy. at home a few times a week a good mobility plan? You know what? It's been a while since I think we addressed this, and I'm glad whoever picked this question, I think this is a good question to talk about because uh, that's probably one of the number one things that um, clients that I used to talk to uh, about mobility would get confused. They'd be mm. like, oh, I'd say, oh, yeah, no, we need to work on your mobility. Like, oh, yeah, no, I do my yoga every Saturday. Yeah. And and we're There's all difference. And we're all very pro yoga, right? I want to make that clear before I explain this, that um, I think yoga is an incredible practice. I think that if, if you have the time to fit it into your schedule, I think uh, it's awesome. But I also think that a, a big part of why I think it's awesome is more for the meditative uh, side of it, more so than like the corrective uh, or joint health side of it, which let me explain. Uh, when you go through a yoga class, it is um, it's very generic. The whole entire class it's is the drawback of all classes, right? Exactly. It's the, exactly it's the same drawback that you would do with any classes. It's not addressing your specific needs. And you know, when I'm training a client, I got ten different clients. I have ten different clients sitting in front of me, and all ten of them are very very different. And all ten of them have now. There's some there's some general exercises or mo- mobility movements that I teach all of them because they all could use it. For example, uh, you know, a lizard with rotation or a ninety ninety tends to be a go to for all of them. They all tend to lack good hip mobility. It's just very common as we age. We just don't move in the transverse plane anymore, and so. You know, doing 90-90, lizard with rotation, which also addresses a little thoracic mobility. Those two tend to like kind of cover everybody. But then there's a lot of other little nuances in 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 their specific movements where they lack and that I would look at and go, oh, okay, you know, she needs to be doing more of this. And I would mm-hmm. prescribe to her. I say, listen, I want you to do, let's say, the combat stretch. You need to be doing that one every day, three times yeah. a day. Because, More joint specific. Yeah, because her, let's say her ankle mobility is horrible. But then her husband is just, he's an engineer and he's on the computer all day long. And his is like thoracic mobility. He has the rounded shoulders. So like handcuff to rotation. I'm like, he's got to do that one like crazy. Now, that's the problem with yoga is it's like you kind of get this broad stroke of all these different movements that are not right. specific to the person. Not only that, but they are stationary static stretching for the most part depending on what and the goal is to end up getting into the pose which is the the end goal so i have to i have to counter a little bit of that because yoga the done properly yoga is an active uh there's a lot of active stretching that's going on if you if you 
talk to most yoga instructors, and it depends on the yoga. If you're yes, doing a yin, exactly, you're doing a yin yoga. There's there's some static stretches, but you know, which, you do, which is the most popular one, by no, the way. No, no, vinyasa, vinyasa, vinyasa flow classes are the most popular ones. Yin, is, are they? Yeah, absolutely. And if if and when you do a vinyasa type class, um, and you're doing it with a good instructor, they are. When it comes to cues, I'll say this right. This is, and I'll stand by this all day long. Yoga. When it comes to cueing people, yeah, yoga instructors are the best in the business. The best group instructors in the world at cueing people to move their 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 their, their position. You know, scoop, scoop your hips, tuck your tailbone. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, you know, look up tall. The way they are able to cue is so good mm-hmm. that taking, if you're a trainer, take a yoga class to learn just the cues alone. Because I think they're phenomenal. Well, because the class is so you know slow paced, where like every little incremental movement they can kind of capture and describe in better detail. Well, That's why I love. Of about all it. the yoga, so here's the thing: of all the group exercise type classes you can do, yoga, yoga focuses the most on form. It's the only one that I don't think should die. No, they, they, <laughs> I, think, I talk about uh, group class training should die yeah. for the most part, but yoga is something that, generally speaking. Anybody and everybody that takes yoga is it's going to be good for it you. It is, and, and the, you are active in the poses, so you are getting a, a functional flexibility. You are getting mobility. A, in terms of group exercise classes, it's the best mobility ba- type group exercise class. I think they're phenomenal. But the drawback is like what Adam's saying. The drawback with the yoga class is the same drawback you would get with any group class. It's general and not individualized. Um, individualized mobility training is superior because it's. For you, it's just for your individual body. You're doing mobility movements to correct your particular issues and problems. This was look. This is one of the the major challenges we had when we created both Maps Prime and Prime Pro. The big big challenge we I remember when we created Maps Prime, we all went off to I think it was Reno. We got ourselves a, a place out in the out in the nowhere, and we all sat there, and we were stuck for almost two days on how we could create an element that would allow people to individualize their mobility and priming work. Like, how can you do that? We're selling a program that everybody could buy. We could put general mobility stuff in there, but then that's not what we're all about. How can we individualize this? This is so crazy because when I assess a client, there's all kinds of things I look at and how am I going to teach the average person to do that? So we had to come up with something that was totally breakthrough and revolutionary that does not exist in the industry except for in Maps Prime which is a compass test that allows the person to test their body and then identify how their individual body needs to be primed and the, the individual mobility movements they do need to do on their own body. MAPS Prime Pro does the same thing, but it's individual tests for each of the major joints. And that's the value of mobility work. The value of mobility work is the indiv- how it's individualized because that's where you're going to get the most benefit. So my clients that like love the yoga classes and then have asked me like, okay, well, Adam, well, then what do I do for my mobility time or what should I do instead of my yoga class? And that's exactly, I, I direct them to Prime Pro and I say, and I normally start with them to keep it simple. Pick, you know, three to five tops of the movements out of there that you fail at the worst, like that you that you struggle with the most. Okay, mm-hmm. pick three, five tops, and literally spend an entire hour working on those those movements, just like you would in a yoga class. Breathe, take your time, connect. Yes, connect. Yes. Use and do the movements with intent. You're not trying to just move through it fast. So make it meditative, like a yoga class. You know, enjoy it, relax while you're doing it between movements, but spend the entire hour on those three to five movements, man, you do that and- The value is incredible. Well, you're getting every bit of the value you would get from the yoga class and a ton more because it's specific to you. Well, think about it this way, okay? Uh, All your exercises, your whole workout has the value that it's providing you, but there's also a potential of value that it could provide you, okay? And oftentimes, the potential of value you can get from your workout is much more than what you're actually getting out of your workout. In other words, if it were if we put this in terms of points, let's say your total workout, your exercises could provide you with 100 points of value. But because your range of motion isn't great, because you lack mobility to do full ranges of motion, because you're not connecting to your body in optimal ways, maybe you're only getting 70% at or 70 points out of that workout. That's the value of mobility work. It literally makes your current workouts far more effective. I noticed this with clients through yoga, okay? And by the way, you can do this with yoga. If you take a yoga class, the poses that are the hardest for you to do, practice those at home. Right. That means you're probably you're addressing 
individual issues for yourself. So if you like to take yoga classes and you're like, okay, how can I individualize this a little bit besides having to hire an, a yoga instructor just to teach me? Mm. Think of the hardest poses that you get into, like whatever. It can be any pose. It could be warrior one. And like, okay, when I do warrior one, my neck gets tight, my shoulders get tight. I'm not able to hold that position. Practice that one at home all the time and you'll get some of that individualized success that you can get from individualized mobility training. Yeah, I like to think of mobility as purely it's strength training at the end of the day like i in terms of flexibility training there's there's specific times where i'm like highlighting that with my clients but for the most part if you're talking about a good mobility plan it is it's you want to you want to make it so you're really connecting by you know tensing up the muscle and and making it into an actual active strength type of an exercise. Yep. And so if you come in with that mentality and you're bringing in like those tough poses that for a reason are, are giving you a hard time because you're not as strong and, and, you know, connected in that area of your body, uh, you know, you're going to do yourself a lot more justice. Well, I remember the first couple of times I took yoga, I had a completely, um, my, my, I had so many misconceptions about it. So I took the class and I thought, okay, we're going to get in these poses poses and we're going to kind of stretch and, and, and stay in these poses. No, man, the instructor walked around and was like, you know, I'm standing in this pose that looks passive, but it's not, you know, push your feet apart or bring your feet in, yeah. drive the energy out through your fingertips, drive energy through your head. Really what they were teaching me to do through yoga is a lot of how we teach people to use, to do priming movements. Right. You don't just sit in 90, 90. It's all about the intent. Yes. You're not, you're not just sitting in 90, 90. You're sitting in 90, 90, but you're, yeah. you're creating energy up through your spine, down through your knees. Could be massively productive or worthless. You totally. Know, depending on your mentality. 100%. Next question is from Michi Tech. How do you adjust your client's macros when they are consistently non-compliant? Uh, More good questions. Yeah. We this, were... is, this is a good one even for just for yourself. Uh, so as a trainer, this is something that it took me a little while to learn. But I had to realize that what I thought uh, the client was getting in terms of value sometimes was, uh, was inaccurate. In other words, if I had somebody show up and train with me twice a week and they were still eating like crap, they weren't working out on their own, they weren't following my advice when they weren't around. I would get very frustrated early on. And sometimes I'd think to myself, I'm not going to train this client anymore. Fuck it. But then I realized something. They're coming two days a week. That two days a week with me is way more than what they would do, be doing without me. So there is some value that they're getting. And so when you have clients that are non-compliant, um, back off. It's not time to talk about nutrition. Yeah. You know? Well, well I, sometimes too, a part of the non-compliance is – and. It, which I, this is what I have found that sometimes we we throw too much at the client uh, too soon. So often, yeah. and uh, you know, you get somebody who has no idea about nutrition and doesn't care about macros, and you know, they that's why they hired you is they want you to do most of the work for them. And like your job, I really like this question because this is actually mm -hmm. more common than you would think. You know, you. You, we all we all talk about you know breaking down macros and what's the best diet all day long, but this type of question is what I really like because this is real life right here. This is what really normally happens is you get a client who's just, you know, they, the reason why they're way out of shape is because they don't give a shit about this stuff and they don't want to take the discipline and time to do that. And so as a trainer, you had to learn ways to get creative. Like, how do I oh, get yeah. this person to become comp compliant that just fails every time I give them a diet, they won't follow it. So you, you, you need to learn to, to give them much smaller, simpler goals and build upon that. And what this is where this is how the the evolution of adding to the diets that are subtracting started for me mm -hmm. was and I had such a hard time of taking someone completely change their diet and, and it sounds so counter right like you're adding things right yeah and this, we're talking about a, a weight loss person right somebody who needs to lose a hundred pounds and here your trainer isn't saying no don't have McDonald's no don't do that I'm not telling them any of that shit I'm saying I want you to have this every day can mm -hmm. we commit to that. And so, and let's example, we use vegetables to start with, but there's, I would build upon that. So a lot of times somebody who eats a lot of bad food is, is eating a lot of processed stuff, doing a lot of fast food. They're not getting a lot of their, their vegetables and fruits. So that always would be the first like easy one and be like, can you commit to me to having like, just, I, I don't want you to worry about anything else. Just can you add a cup of berries a day? Or can you add a, one giant salad every single day? And they're like, okay, yeah, I could do that. And that, that's all we speak to, you know, until they're consistent with that and they're constantly doing that. And what ends up happening is 
when they do that, it ends up replacing something else in the diet that was probably not as good for them as that cup of berries or that big ass And salad. they make that decision themselves. You right. don't have to take anything Exactly. Out. You're not taking anything from them. And then once I get them doing that consistently, then I go like, okay, I, I have a new challenge for us. This is what I want us to do. Again, I'm not going to tell you you can't have any of these things, but can we commit to eating 12 ounces total a day of a lean meat? You can choose chicken, you can do fish, you can do turkey. These I just want to commit to 12 hours. Basically, two times in the day, you're going to eat a meat that's a lean meat. And okay, yeah, I could do that. Mm-hmm. And so you get them to do that. And then next thing you know, that's now replacing something else that would not be ideal for it. And you start to build in these better habits. And you're kind of tricking the client into getting them into eating and having better eating behaviors and a better relationship with food. And it's a, a very clever way to do it without them feeling like they're having to follow this diet. It, it, what you, people need to realize just how brilliant what you're saying is. And this is why when I go and I talk to trainers and, and, and try to communicate to them how to become better trainers, the thing I focus on is communication. Because what Adam is saying might be might be counter. You might be thinking they need to take all the garbage out of their diet. They need to reduce their calories. They need, but it doesn't work. And I don't mean it doesn't work in the sense that if they did that, it wouldn't work. Of course, if they did that, it would work. But that doesn't work because people don't do that. Right. It's a very ineffective way of communicating how to change your nutrition. What Adam's saying is a much more effective way of communicating to get people to change their nutrition. And so that's a great point that you bring up. Maybe your clients are non-compliant because the way you're selling it mm-hmm. is wrong. Yeah. And that's exactly what you're doing. You're selling better nutrition to your client. And, and when someone buys it, they have to buy it. I wish there was a sort of a belt system like they have in martial arts and for <laughs> trainers because you yeah. could, I could identify them right away based off their mentality with their client of what they're trying to achieve with their client right. uh, versus like being a behavioral manager. Right. And why we always stress, you know, the point of all these things like processed food, what worries us about that, you know, and, you know, artificial sugars and all these types of things that, yes, on paper and in lab settings, you know, you can make arguments for, you know, it doesn't do much harm versus what we actually see in our clients' behaviors and how it alters that. And like, how can we can peer into that? Uh, that client even further and see what the domino sequence is going to be mm-hmm. after that. And so if you present them with that really impactful domino ahead of time, maybe it's, you have to like really put the work upon yourself to reduce, uh, you know, the amount of information that you've received over, you know, decades right. going through, you know, fitness and health and nutrition knowledge uh, and what you can present them that's going to have the most impact without any of the confusion alongside it. No, no, very, very well said, Uh, extremely well said. And that's, I think, the most absolute most important thing is how can – and do this for yourself. Here's a big one. This is a very, very big one now, patience. I had to learn patience as a personal trainer. I had a guy who I trained who wanted to lose 50 pounds, and it took him three years to lose 35 pounds. Three years. Now, you know what happened after he lost that 35 pounds in three years? Took him another six months to lose the rest of the weight, and then he never gained it back. Mm. Now, the old version of me, the new when I was the new trainer, that would have been way too slow. You need to make this happen. Got to do this. Gotta. But then I started to understand, look, we're dealing with behaviors that take a long time. This person's had these behaviors for decades, and I'm trying to change that in a month. You know, I'm going to be a little bit more patient. I'm going to take my time. And sometimes they're not ready to talk about macros and nutrition. That's okay. Because you're here working out with me and it's better than doing nothing at all. And and treat yourself this way. So if you're not a trainer, this applies to you as well. If you're trying to change your eating habits, if you're trying to become more consistent with your workouts, be patient and take your time with it and start slow. And that's really the only way to find long-term success, at least for the majority of people I've ever worked with. Next question is from Solomon Roskin. How would you train clients who do not work out on their own? This is a great follow-up question to that question because right now what's going through my head is I'm, re- I'm remembering the trainers who had, had struggled with re-signs and coming to me and telling me like, you know, oh, I can't get them to follow the meal plan. Oh, they're not they're not going to re-sign with me. They can't, they can't handle the training, all this stuff. And it's a very similar thing here, right? Like like what we were just talking about with the, the macros and then the, the nutrition – that also falls into like the exercise thing. And this is something that took me years before I started to really piece this together too. Again, as a trainer, 
I see this client, I put them on a meal plan. I have this elaborate, you know, program that I design for them for the next six months that I want them to follow. And the reality of it is a majority of people can't stick to any of it, can't stick to none of it. And, you know, and my attitude kind of was with that is like, oh, they're just not serious enough. I'll just keep going until I find another client who is serious enough. But that what I wasn't doing was was improving my job as a trainer and finding out, okay, how, how figuring out how can I start to change these behaviors in these people? And what I'm currently doing right now obviously isn't working because more than half of them aren't sticking with me or aren't staying with fitness long term. And a lot of that is how much that I was prescribing to them. So if there's somebody who doesn't that only works out when they work out with me, well, that's probably because I'm expecting them to do these training sessions that look like my training sessions that are overly complicated, that they're I'm pushing the shit out of them <laughs> and it's hard. And they're like, fuck that. The only reason why I do this is because you're yelling at me and you're pushing me through this. And that was a big mistake. And, on, and this is where I began to start to prescribe walking and prescribe yoga classes and prescribe- Like two exercises. Yes, or prescribe something. a mobility drill. Yeah. We just talked earlier about mobility and stuff. This is another example of that. So I've got a client who I train three days a week and I'm trying to get them to do some things on their own outside. Of, and instead of asking them to do that leg session that I just did with them and they walked out crippled and were sweating and in agony, I'm not going to ask them to try and do that on Sunday because they're not going to. The only reason why they're doing it now is because they paid for me to do it to them. But I would do things like, hey- you know, the handcuffed to rotation mobility drill, we, we need to be doing that as much as possible. So let's set a goal this week that the two days that you don't see me, you know, I need you to spend, you know, two times in the day, spend 10 minutes doing that. Can we commit to that? And get them to commit to these things that I know if they do that, they will feel a difference. I'll even see it in their movement. And then when I see them on their day, I can follow because, up. Because they do it. Right. Do you, do you remember the workouts that you gave clients to do on their own when you first became a trainer? Yeah. <laughs> I do. Yeah. I would be the most elaborate. It was like, oh, a, yeah. like a full-on MAPS it's program. like two hours. Yeah. I do. Yeah. Oh, I know you hired me because you don't know how to work out and you've ever done this before and you need help. Oh, by the way, here's your workouts you can do on your own. They should take you about you know 90 minutes to do. And if you have any questions, go online, look up. It's insane. It's absolutely insane. You're 100% right, Adam. It's like, give them things that you know that they'll do on their own. And sometimes, I actually had a client, this is no joke now. I had a client that was so resistant. One of, one of my favorite success stories. She was the most unhealthy person I've ever met in my entire life. I've talked about her before. I got a Coke I, drinker. Yeah. I, I hope she doesn't listen to this, this podcast. <laughs> she didn't drink water. I mean, that's how unhealthy she drank soda. That's how she got her, her fluids. And my goal was to get her to eat, to change her nutrition. And you know where I had to start? This is what I did. I started by saying, can you add, you know, uh, a serving of vegetables, uh, to, to, to your day? No. And I, I told her, I said, it has to be something that you're going to do. This has to be realistic. So be honest with me. And luckily she was honest. So I said, be honest with me if you think that you're not going to do this or that it's unlikely. So I'm like, can you add one serving of vegetables every single day? No. Can you add one serving of vegetables three days a week? No. One day a week? No. One piece of broccoli? No. Can you read a, a nutrition book? No. Can you read one page from one nutrition book <laughs> to start with once a week? Yes. That's where we started. Yeah. Wow. Literally, we started, I'd give her a page to read. She would read it. I'd train her. And we talk about it. Yeah. Now, slowly, you know what that turned into over the years? Slowly, it turned into completely changed behaviors, yeah. completely changed nutrition. But it was a really, really slow process. Oh, yeah. Because you give someone a bunch of stuff that they're not going to do, it's as good as nothing. <laughs> There's, you're not you're a new it. trainer. That's like such a lost cause in your mind. You're like, no. Totally. Right. Have Abandoned I, ship. Have I shared the, the the colored sticker thing that I used to do? So I used to. Yeah, I love uh, this yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so I used to go to like your staple center or your staple, uh, you know, whatever, local staples or whatever you guys got over in your area uh, with office supply stuff. And they have these like little. Office max. Yeah, yeah, right. These little circle uh, colored circles that are stickers. And I would, you know, pick again, a couple, I either exercise and it could be as simple as this, like 10 squats. Okay. That's it. Or, you know, three handcuffed with rotations, like the most basic, simple things, or someone like to Sal's lady, he's talking about drink a glass of water when you, <laughs> and I would, I would tell them, okay, I want one on the refrigerator, one on your bathroom uh, mirror, one next to the TV. And I'd give them these like strategic spots in their house that I know that they're going to go by at least once or twice or three times a day. And I'd say, when you see this sticker, do your 10 squats. When you see that squ sticker, do this. And it makes it kind of fun and challenging. And let's be honest, probably they didn't do it every single time, but it, at least it was there as a reminder. And I know they, they were doing more than what they were doing before because I had set mm -hmm. the, all these little reminders. And you start setting 
simple little tasks and goals like that, and then you can build on that. And I mm. think that was probably the number one mistake that I made and most of my trainers that work for me for many years make is, you know, sometimes we forget like these people that are hiring us, what, what, where their starting point is and what is like overwhelming to them. And they're never going to admit it to you, by the way, either. They're never going to be like, oh, yo, Adam, that's just, that's way too much work for me. I can't do that. Nobody no, they're wants- all going to be like, oh, oh, yeah, I could do all that. Yeah, exactly. They're going to say that. But then if, if you're having a hard time with compliance or you're, they're not working out on their own, they're not doing these things, start with very, very basic behaviors, you know, and that could be going for walks. It could be squatting your body weight 10 times. It could be holding a plank for one minute. It could be doing the combat stretch for 30 seconds. I mean, start small, create the behaviors, build upon that. And that applies both for macronutrients and for exercise. Next question is from Ladybug Laura. What's the profession that you value highly but could never do? Oh, you got you guys like this question. <laughs> well, you, one came to mind right away for me because when I was a kid, um, I thought I was going to be a lawyer. I was dead set on being a lawyer. Like everybody in my family, I mean, of course, when you're a kid, the reason why if your family members tell you that because you argue. You're good at arguing. Yeah, I yeah. argued all the time. I, mean, I got the same yeah. thing. <laughs> I, was, I was outgoing and yeah. I made good arguments and I argued with everybody and whatever and I had an opinion for everything. So everyone's like, you're going to be a lawyer. But they say it enough times as your kid, then as you become a young adult, you're like, yeah, I'm going to be a lawyer. Yeah. So <laughs> and then you realize you have to just read well, so, all the time. So I, oh, date, I date this girl in high school who her father is a lawyer. And I'll never forget the. This is the day I changed my mind as I I went to his office and I walk in his office and you know it's about the size of our studio right here, and every Just covered with books. All four walls are books, and I asked him. I said, "Did you read all these?" And he was like, well, "Of course." And I started picking them up and opening them, and they're like all laws and cases, all legalese, and, and I'm like. Bleh. Like, I, I mean, I looked at one and thought, I don't know if I could get through one of these if I had to, you know, maybe a couple of them, if it was like, if I had to, to pass the test or become, and it was that moment that I went, I could never do this profession yeah. for that simple reason that I, I could not see myself in my entire lifetime having the discipline to sit down and, and not only you have to know that stuff, it's not just like breeze through it. It's like, you need to understand it fro- forward and back. And that, but it also gave me this incredible respect for that profession. I mean, the the amount of of discipline it would take to read that type of material. So my cousin's a lawyer, and and ninety five percent of what you do as a lawyer is that you're at your desk and you're researching and reading and writing shit out, that kind of stuff. It's the the other five percent, maybe even less than that. Two percent is what you see in movies. Yeah, the arguing. In yeah, well, the part that you probably your parents, you know, told you you should be a lawyer for the talking part. Yeah. You know? yeah, my family said the same thing, and then when I kind of dived into it, I was like, hell no. Yeah, I like the talking part. The rest of it sucks. <laughs> so I started. I saw my podcaster now. That's what yeah. I do now. I talk. <laughs> <laughs> for me, a profession that I value a lot that I could never do. I had to think about this for a second, but um, police officer. I think that's a big one. Oh, man. Um, I think what a tough, tough what a man, tough one right tough. now. Uh, Today's uh, climate, uh, man. Uh, I, I, you know, they don't get the respect and admiration um, that I think they deserve. I mean, to, they literally do the shit. Um, they're the ones that keep order. If, if you're in trouble, that's who you call. Now, I know there's bad ones out there, but there's bad everything out there. But for the most part, these these. People put their lives on the line when shit's going down and everybody's running. Mm-hmm. They're the ones that have to go there and stop it and, and and make it happen. And so for me, that's a that's a, and I, I've had a lot of friends that were police officers, especially when they do jujitsu. And I'd hear stories, and I'm just like, I don't know if I could do that. You know, I, I don't know if I could if I could handle that level of stress. You well, know, that I, level of scrutiny right now. I mean, I feel so bad because because it's like any profession. To your point, there's a couple bad apples. And they're now under a microscope in everything that they do and judged how they did it, how they looked when they did it, how they said what they said. Did they follow exactly the but protocol? The, the, I mean, the stress and, of and it. Meanwhile, yeah, like, meanwhile, while they're having to worry about all these ways of doing it, they're also worried about their life. Totally. Like, mm-hmm. you know, at the, at the beginning, at the end of the day, it's just like, you know, you, you got to make sure that you, you protect yourself and you're safe. But uh, above that, they're having to put all these other things first, which, man, that would be very hard for me. I feel like. 
I would first think about myself and my own safety. Like, I give a shit if I'm being politically correct. I give a shit about the protocol. First of all, I'm not going to die. And then I'll figure out all the other things. Then I'll, then I'll be politically correct. And then I'll try and be the procedure. And, and, so, and the stress, like, I, I, you know, I've had a few conflicts in my life. Um, and I don't like them. They're, they're stressful as fuck. Yeah. I don't like the way I feel You afterwards. carry it home with you. You carry... You know, and you're a cop. That's what you do. You know yeah. what I mean? Oh, we need we, we you get a phone call because some dude won't leave a restaurant. Yeah. Conflict. That's your job. Go in there and 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 fight the dude or get him out or whatever. Like, you got to deal with that shit all the time. And then the stuff you see on the highway and then the fear. Like, you know, I have a a, a buddy who's a police officer and he talks about how pulling people over. You know, someone got a police officer got shot for just a routine pull, pulling someone over because the guy I guess had some warrants and. So you got that on your mind the whole time. Yeah. That is an incredibly, yeah, incredibly stressful. difficult, stressful job, and I don't think they get the the respect uh, that they deserve. And I I value the shit out of it. Yeah. Don't think I could do what it. What do you yeah. think, Justin? Yeah, gynecologist. I had one, yeah, gynecologist. Actually, like along the lines of uh, <laughs> health practitioners. Okay, uh, like uh, ER surgeons, ER doctors. Uh, that like for me, it's immediately. It, very similar in terms of the stress level and the on call, like just having to wake up, like uh, any job where it's like you're on call at ungodly hours, like even just people are, are ambulance and paramedics and, yeah. you know, people that are out there like literally saving lives and, and, uh, you know, somebody will live or die based off of either your hands or your decisions. And, you know, I was either going to say that or like the president, but I didn't want to get all like, crazy and <laughs> piss everybody <laughs> off with that one. Uh, Cause that's why we have checks and balances and they don't have too much power. Right. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, I think that I definitely revere and, and to like nowadays they, they do not even make as much money as they should. Like, I think they should make LeBron James money. Yeah. You know, for the for the kind of shit that they do, saving people out there. So I don't know. I just I have a big admiration and respect for in, in armed forces and people that are out there protecting and saving us. You know, from being assholes that we do every day. Yeah. No. You brought it up another one earlier too, which it's not a profession, but it is uh, something that is high. Yeah. I value highly. Definitely. And this would be just a, a stay at home parent. Right, I th I mean, oh me boy, you guys are really reaching for brownie points. Today. <laughs> getting, well, no, huh? think about it, I dude. Bring that. I didn't want to be too virtuous. Can you? Well, <laughs> uh, that answer, so I didn't say. No, it. when you brought it up earlier, I made fun of you. But if you yeah. think about it, is there anything that you think could be more valuable than like oh, raising good humans? Are you kidding me? Those uh, are th that's the impact. That's the first point of contact with your creating a human being that's going to be either good or bad in society. Oh, this yeah. is a, this is a, a conversation with Katrina and I right now. I mean, because she's got an, an incredible job and. And uh, makes really good money, and of course that that helps the family out. But I told her the other day, like, I mean, I don't know if there is an amount of money that you could make that I think could help the family out more than you being with our child more and and being a, a very intricate role in who he develops to be as an as a young adult, like. Man, that that's everything, and I guess maybe now being a dad, like I think about that more than I ever did before. You know, I, I think I always wanted a partner who, you know, I always wanted to have a power, be the power couple, and have a badass wife who's like killing it. And I have that, and now that I have a kid, I feel like that's changed. Like mm. what I think, what I want more, and what I think is even more important is like, man, having somebody who I trust that is putting their heart and soul into making sure that this human turns out to be to me the job of a parent is to make sure your kid is better than you like that's like how i feel yeah, totally. I feel like you win at that point right yeah. my number like I, I can't i can't expect him to be a rocket scientist i don't know if he's going to play in the nba like i would like all these things but at the end of the day what i will gauge if i passed or failed at this dad thing is can i make him a better human being than myself. Mm -hmm. Can I give him all of everything that I have and then he can have something to build upon that? And you know, nobody lays that foundation more than a mom, dude. A mom who has that that has is the first line of defense in that. So mm -hmm. no, I, I could get Or, or a dad, that. you know, or a or a stay at right. home dad. Right, I mean, right. any, any parent. I mean, I was having this conversation uh with my daughter. It's funny you you, you we were we were talking about work and jobs and she's like, Well, how much does this job make and how much does that job make? And I said, "Why are you asking me about how much money uh, these you know these people make?" She's like, "Well, because you know making a lot of money, you know that would be really cool." And I said, "Well, it's okay." I said, "But what do you think is the most important thing?" And she said, "In this, I made my heart just like warm and everything." She's like, um, "I think family." 
family is the most important thing. And I was like, oh, that's my girl, man. She's so <laughs> you get she's so it. Good. Yeah, yeah. You, you raising good human beings, and unfortunately, a lot of people don't do a good job of it. Yeah. <laughs> but the people that do do a good job of it, man, those are the most valuable people because then they turn into the, you know, the ER surgeon. Or the yes. um, or the police officer that's awesome. Right, right. Or I forgot what you said. Lawyer. Lawyer yeah. who does a good job. So there you go. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download our guides. They're all absolutely free. You can also find us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam.